We're getting breaking news, everyone. An owner of a consumer testing company has found guilty of $46 million fraud scheme by fabricating SPF testing results for the past 30 years. Our investigator, Leah Yu, has the latest. Audrey Strauss, the United States Attorney for Southern District of New York, announced that Gabriel Letizia Jr., the owner and the executive director of AMA Laboratories, has pled guilty today for defrauding customers by fabricating SPF test results for decades. For this, he was sentenced to five years in prison and ordered to pay damages. It turns out he was testing on fewer subjects than the legal minimum, and then they lied about it. So last year at Crave Beauty, we were developing a mineral sunscreen that was expected to be around SPF 30. Then we sent the same formula made from the same batch to two different labs. Results, two drastically different results with one SPF 15 and another being SPF 30. Like what? Then how do we know which result to trust? No, you're not the first person that's had this happen. Now, this issue is a lot more common than you might think. Even if the lab didn't fabricate the results, it's very common to find varying SPF test results from lab to lab. The Korean sunscreen scandal back in 2020 was a little bit different, and our friend Odile has covered and elaborated very well in this video. At Crave Beauty, we also fell short by not doing our due diligence and blindly trusting our manufacturers' reports and since then, we learned a lot. So if a sunscreen claims it's SPF 50, but another report says it's SPF 19, you certainly have a lot of questions. How is SPF number determined? Can sunscreen protection level degrade over time while you're using it? And most importantly, can we trust sunscreens? What is SPF anyway? SPF stands for sun protection factors. The higher the SPF, the more it'll slash that UV ray for you so that your skin can be more protected from the UV rays. How does a sunscreen get these SPF numbers? There are multiple ways to test for an SPF, but the gold standard is ISO 2444 2019 version that is most commonly and widely accepted across different regions and countries. We first go to a third party lab, and then we need to recruit 10 human volunteers so that there's an average number of SPF we can calculate, and we need real human subjects to test this. Third, we're gonna bring in that sexy solar machine that mimics the real UV ray. On day one, we start burning them. I'm kidding. The human volunteers will be exposed to the solar machine on their back of the skin and then after 24 hours on day two, they come back into the lab. The lab technicians assess how pink or red they turned or how burnt they are and they will categorize into different skin types. And then what they will do is they will finally apply the sunscreen, but they not only apply the sunscreen that is being tested, but they apply a control or a reference sunscreen that already is guaranteed to have a specific SPF number to compare. Now it's super important on how a lab technician applies the sunscreen. There's a very specific way that the ISO standard suggests and recommends and actually trains the lab technician to apply the sunscreen very evenly on the back of the human volunteer so that there is a uniform and even coverage and an even product distribution. Then the human volunteers will be exposed to the sexy solar machine again in different solar intensity. After 24 hours, they come back to the lab and the lab technician assesses the site of the apply the sunscreen and the control sunscreen to see how pink they got. And depending on how well protected the skin is, they will determine the SPF level and they will average it out from the 10 human volunteers. So obviously it seems like a very scientific and reliable and very objective way to test SPF, right? But here's the plot twist. For the SPF testing results, the variability between labs are known to be anywhere between 20 to 50%. That's huge, but why? So I asked the expert, Craig Dennison, who works for Eurofins, which is an SPF testing lab, and he was also involved in the development of ISO standard 24444 2019 version. Yes, there is going to be variation within the method and it largely comes down to a perception of that MED, the perception of that slight redness, that slight pinkish endpoint. So you and I might see a slightly different, whether it's complete, whether it's half, it's that perception. And with the new standard, with the 2019 standard, they've gone to address that issue to make sure everyone is categorically getting the same results, but there's still going to be variability. So even if all the labs are using the same testing methodology, depending on the lab or the lab technician, how they assess the pinkness and the redness through their eyes, and depending on the human volunteers, the subjects themselves, it can result in varying different SPF test results. So if you're buying an SPF 50 sunscreen, it may have one report saying that it's SPF 50, but another saying that it's SPF 35. So I wanted to find out more about the variability factors and I contacted four different testing labs, but they all declined to comment. But here's what we found. Number one, ask 
Craig said the lock condition resets us to test is one variability, and depending on how much pressure they use to smear and apply the sunscreen on the back of the human volunteers can also influence the result, which is why there's a standardized way of applying and distributing the product. And the indoor temperature, the humidity, it all can influence the results at the slightest. Number two, every test will include human volunteers, and depending on which human volunteers and which skin type and skin tone and how pink and burn and tan they get, it can definitely influence the SPF test results. Even categorizing the skin type can be very subjective. That's why the new ISO method 2444 2019 version introduced a new way of determining skin types, which is called ITA. But the FDA method still uses the old way of categorizing skin types, which is Fitzpatrick scale skin type. So basically, it's just trying to make it a little bit more scientific as opposed to someone saying, yeah, I burn easily, therefore you're skin type 1. Then third, there's batch to batch variation. Now, not all cookie dough is going to turn out in the same texture even if they follow the same recipe and instructions. Same with skincare. Every batch will have a slightly different formula or a slightly different texture, which can vary in results. Also, sunscreen can degrade in the bottle, which can result in different SPF testing results. So if you test two different sunscreen, the same formula, but manufactured this year and last year, they will have a slightly different result. That's why it's so important for you to stop using any old sunscreen that is over a year or that's expired, and same with any active formulas. And it's not only that they're degrading and being less effective and reducing the SPF, but they can degrade into harmful byproducts and, and degradates. Not only do they degrade, but I mean, for example, if your emulsion falls apart, it's not as effective as it was at the beginning. It doesn't sit on the skin the same way. If you're using just a zinc formula, zinc is very heavy, so it can separate. And uh, yeah, it just on a physical level, that stability is important as well. So if a product becomes unstable as an individual ingredient inside of the formula, it can certainly lose its activity and how it can achieve X, Y, and Z, in this case, SPF performance. By the way, this is Alan, who has many years of experience of launching SPF formulas in the United States. The, the zinc oxide basically oxidizes it out of itself and it turns into nothing, pretty much. I mean, it's unstable, but it, it's not going to give you the performance that you once had. The formula, typically you would see the color change. You would see separation in the formula if this is happening. An odor change would be noticeable as well. But effectively, if, if you're not in that neutral pH range with oil and waters in zinc and TiO2 SPFs, you've got a, a worthless formula. Okay, but the mineral sunscreen we sent to the lab was freshly made in the lab and came from the same batch. So what do you think might have caused the difference between the two different results of SPF 30 and SPF 15? The mineral filters are dispersed, so you could have the um, chance that they were unevenly dispersed inside the formula. So mineral sunscreens like zinc oxide and titanium dioxide or TiO2 that Ellen is referring here are basically white powders that need to be evenly dispersed and distributed in the formula. But it's definitely a really big formulation challenge. So in a lot of unstable zinc formulas, it's easy to find a big zinc clump here and a small one there. Apart from that, is there anything in the formula that can trick or influence the results? You get um, SPF boosters, which are not officially the active ingredients. They don't officially either absorb the UV light or reflect the UV light, um, but they can influence the SPF. Vitamin E and vitamin C are both antioxidants. They don't actually block the UV light. So they will, I mean, they're acting as antioxidants, but they don't actually boost the SPF. So um, something like a hydrocortisone can reduce the redness. So that's actually tricking the results in a way. So basically, antioxidants don't actually protect your skin from the UV rays, which is obvious. They just reduce your skin's redness. And because SPF testing is examining the redness shown on the skin, that can trick the results. So in a way, anti boosting technologies, antioxidants, anti-inflammatories, film formers, they're sort of tricking the test. Because all we have to do is show that we're not inducing skin-induced erythema. So if an antioxidant can prevent the redness from occurring for a longer period of time, the test assumes that it's always coming from the active ingredient that's being used. Why can't we just use the in vitro method, which is done on the palate, not on human subjects? I know a lot of R&D people do use them, and we use it as an R&D tool, but it can be very, very misleading. 
So yeah, I certainly wouldn't wouldn't base anything on in vitro results yet. But the industry experts and labs around the world also realize that the current SPF testing method is not perfect. It's invasive because it's exposing real humans to carcinogens, aka UV rays. It's complex, it's time consuming, it's costly, and it can have a lot of variations between labs. So we're personally wishing for an alternative SPF testing method, but I think there's good news. Involving volunteers is quite complex, costly, and often leads to significant variations between different test institutes. Therefore, alternative SPF methods have been investigated for decades. So they're working together to create a less invasive and less costly and also more precise way of testing the SPF value. Yeah, so we're currently halfway through alternate SPF and there's an alt SPF website that people can go to and it is investigating three new methods. So one of them is an in vitro method where you're essentially using a spectrophotometer with different PMMA plates. So sorry, the one with the in vitro with the spectrophotometer, it's actually being applied by a, a, a robot on. So there's no longer a question on the application rate. Wait, that sounds so cool. Another one is um, still measured on human skin, but we're no longer measuring the accumulated dose through the form of sunscreen on the skin, the erythema at the end. It's now actually measuring the reflectance of light off the skin. And so you get your result immediately. So all the new alt SPF testing methods are supposed to be finished by the end of February of 2023. Then they need to be reviewed and also validated in order to get passed for an official ISO SPF testing method. This isn't to scare you away from applying sunscreen or choosing a sunscreen. The current SPF testing method is definitely not perfect, but there are four things that you can do to ensure that you're getting a good amount of sun protection. Number one, Go with a company that you trust. You know, companies that have become more transparent is someone I would gravitate to so that they are disclosing not just the formula, but they're educating me as a consumer on what they went through to build the formula. And ask for an SPF test result if you want to be extra clear. Number two, check the UV filter concentration on the back of the packaging to make your own assumption, but know that the formulation is king, so it's not going to be a very correct way, but here's what the expert says. In Australia, you need to actually list your, your active ingredients and you need to list the concentrations as well. So if you've got a, a formula with 5% and they're claiming 50 plus, many alarm bells. So it is it's a little bit tricky. Number three. Apply more sunscreen than you might think is enough and reapply when you can. The most important part of sunscreen is applying the correct dose. That's why it's so important for you to find a sunscreen that encourages you to apply more. Number four, wear UV protective clothes, wear hats, sunglasses when you can, and avoid direct sunlight in the midday. I hope you guys found this video interesting. If you did, please share this video on your social media or any of your friends that might be interested in learning more about sunscreen testing. Thank you guys so much once again, and I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.